Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Today we're checking out 101 Facts About London. According to all known laws of aviation, there is no way that a bee should be able to fly. Greetings, mother factors! <laughs> I am Sam, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about the wonderful city of London. Yes, there's just something about my nation's capital that delights the senses and- Traveler announcement, all tubes everywhere have been cancelled because of a leaf on the line. Oh, for Christ's sake, this is ridiculous. I hate this city. I'm pretty sure it's the reason I have a cold. But why was the Southern Gate House on Old London Bridge so horrifying? Which skyscraper became a death ray? And why can't people seem to figure out not to stand on the left? I mean, it's not difficult, guys. There's one of two positions. Ah! Two <laughs> out of three of those questions are going to be answered. So, hop on the bus, get us. Ah! Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered. So, hop on a bus, get a seat, then stand up out of that seat because you feel guilty for taking it. Because I think <laughs> there's an old person that wants it, but actually they're not that old and you're all embarrassed. And prepare yourself for 101 facts about London. All right. This is a 33 minute video. So, let's buckle in. I already watched the 101 facts about England in general. I think it was England, or maybe it was the UK, but there was a lot of stuff. And now we're down to specifically London. I bet they're gonna say things like, Big Ben is not the clock, it's the bell. The Queen lives in Buckingham Palace. The Tower Bridge is not the London Bridge. The London Bridge is in Arizona. Things like this, I'm expecting. 101? All right, grab your cup of coffee, tea, whatever you got. Let's check it out. And prepare yourself for 101 facts about London. Prepare yourself. Number one. London is the most highly populated city and capital of the country of England and the sovereign nation of the United Kingdom. Yeah, but even more sense. importantly, it's where I live. Woo! It's therefore by definition the greatest city on the face of the planet Earth. Number a two. Narcissist. London was founded by the Romans in 50 AD, who named it Londinium, which frankly sounds like a variety of off-brand anti-diarrhea pills, but hey, who do <laughs> you, Romans? There's a number of theories regarding what London means, one of which claims that Londinium derives from the Celtic word Londinios, which means the place of the bold one. That's bold with an O, not an A. The bold Number three. One. But Londinium wasn't the only name our fair city has borne. Variations upon Londinium used by the Romans include Londinio, Londiniensi, and Londinensium. And in the year 368, it was officially renamed Augusta, a name principally used by really? Roman officials. During Anglo-Saxon times, the settlement was variously known as Ludenwick, Londonwick, and London Burr. Did they rename it Augusta for Augustus Caesar? In 368, the city was renamed Augusta. It is thought that the name was predominantly used by officials as a way of highlighting the city as an important imperial center. Yeah, I guess Augusta is better than the bald one. So why did it change back? Because the Romans left. Okay, because Rome was being sacked. Number four. The last remaining Roman soldiers are thought to have left Britain in 407 AD. Soon afterwards, the Anglo-Saxons took over and London was pretty much abandoned, if you can imagine such a thing. Number five. Approximately 200 years after the Romans scarpered, London was reoccupied by the Saxons. And no, I don't mean Harold Saxon. You want a season three new Who reference? They established an area roughly located outside what is now known as Trafalgar Square as the base for their new city and port. Number six. Okay. The next few hundred years saw London change hands from the Anglo-Saxons to Danish Vikings, and then back again, until right. a relatively stable division of the kingdoms settled in England, with the Saxons in southern England, the Angles in a large area of the north of that, and the Vikings holding the remainder of eastern and northern England. I reacted to a video about all that, and it's pretty amazing how it all came together. It was just this chaos of wars for centuries. It ended up becoming England. Amazing history. At some point, the Saxons persuaded the Danish Vikings to stay the heck out of London in return for a regular monthly income of silver pennies. Number seven. Eventually, the Norman William the Conqueror sauntered in, defeated the Anglo-Saxon King Harold at the Battle of Hastings, and quickly quashed any remaining pockets of resistance before being declared King of England on Christmas Day 1066. Oh, how festive. Right. As part of his effort to secure his rule, William ordered the erection <laughs> of several large <laughs> castles, oh. to which the Normans could easily <laughs> retreat if threatened with rebellion. One such castle was the White Tower, which is the inner building you see at the Tower of London. Number eight. Around the mid-14th century, London was in the midst of an exciting new craze slash bacterial epidemic known as the Black Death. 
Caused yes. by the bubonic plague, estimates for how many Londoners perished at this time do vary. From just below a third to as much as 60% of the entire population of London dying from the illness. Terrifying. Number 9. Fast forward to the year 1666, when there was a big fire in London, and it was great. Kinda. As such, it was dubbed the Great Fire of London. Despite the fire sweeping across an enormous section of central London, the death toll is thought to be surprisingly low, as only six people were known to have died in this great oh. fire. I wonder if I could find a map of where the fire was. London map of fire. 1666. <sighs> Three sixes. Ah. Oh, I'm not... I mean, I know this is the River Thames, but I don't know London well enough to... Really know what I'm looking at. Oh, it's near London Bridge. Okay, there's the Tower of London. Okay, wow. And only six people died? That's like right in the thick of the city, isn't it? <laughs> wow. Did they have a fire department back then? Who put the fire out, I wonder? I'm sure I could read that, but I don't... We're only... We're not even four minutes through this video. We got 30 more minutes to go. Number 10. Though only six people officially died in the Great Fire of London, as many as eight people have died from falling or jumping from the monument to the Great Fire of London, which is located near Pudding Lane, where the Great Fire started. A chain link barrier now stops people falling from the top, which, yeah, I mean, why was that not, why was that not there in the first place? Yeah. Right. Okay, moving on. Number 11. During Victorian times, London was not only the capital city of the United Kingdom, but also the seat of the largest and most populous empire in history. Though it's not necessarily something to be super proud of. Colonialism <laughs> isn't cool, the kids. Despite this elevated status, London was still horrendously filthy, with diseases like cholera and tuberculosis slashing the life expectancy in some areas down to less than 20 years of age. Wow. Number 12. The true identity of London's most notorious serial killer, Jack the Ripper, has never been discovered. We don't even know his name's Jack. Authorities at the time and history buffs since then have accused a number of different people, including the author Lewis Carroll, Queen Victoria's grandson, Albert, and Queen Victoria's doctor, Sir William Gull. Jeez, Queen Vic hung up with some right wrongers. No, that just makes a good story. I recently watched uh, another video. I didn't film a reaction to it, but I just, you know, sometimes I watch YouTube for my personal enjoyment. I don't remember his name, but there was a guy who was with a roommate. His roommate was a woman who was having trouble finding work, so she became a prostitute. So this guy w was totally against his female roommate being a prostitute. So he went out and murdered a prostitute to try to scare her out of becoming a prostitute, but it didn't work. So he kept killing more prostitutes, and eventually he killed his roommate because she was a prostitute. I think his brother or his dad was a surgeon or something, so he had some anatomical knowledge. I don't remember his name. Anyway, to me, he seems like the, uh, the biggest um, suspect. The Queen Victoria people, that's, uh, I think those are just fun stories. Ah, oh, dead people. Including the author Lewis Carroll, Queen no. Victoria's grandson, Albert, no. and Queen Victoria's doctor, Sir William Gull. No. Jeez, Queen Vic hung up with some right wrongers. No, she was fine. Number was fine. 13. During the Second World War, London was ruthlessly bombed by the German Luftwaffe as a prelude to invasion in a period known as the Blitz. During one period, London was bombed for 57 consecutive nights, but hey, we ended up winning, so wow. suck it, Nazis. Don't literally suck it. Number 14. 57. As a result of the war, the population of London fell so dramatically that the city didn't return to its pre-war population level until January 2015. Number 15. Whoa. So, so many people in London were killed in World War II that it took till 2015 to get that population number back? That's amazing. Number 15. During the war, London Zoo decided to kill all their venomous animals as a precaution fearing that animals could escape and wreak oh. havoc on the city if their enclosures were damaged by German bombs. Number 16. I get it. Most capital cities only get to be the capital of one country and one country only. But during the Second World War, London managed to become the capital of several countries at once. As the Nazis marched through Europe being all evil and twatty, London ended up becoming one of the very few safe cities left in Europe, and as such, it became the home of exiled governments from five European nations, starting with Poland, then shortly followed by a number of others, including oh, Norway, wow. Belgium, Holland, and France. So London became the capital of all those countries during World War II. Number 17. 
There is actually a difference between the city of London and London, which sounds confusing, and that's because it is. When Romans found Londinium, they built a nice big wall around it, Trump style, keeping all 12 square <laughs> miles of it nice and protected. So well protected, in fact, that when Bill Conqueror appeared almost a thousand years later, he decided to negotiate with those living inside the walls, guaranteeing them rights and privileges as long as they recognized him as king. In the subsequent centuries, an enormous population built up around the city walls, which would eventually become known simply as London. However, the city of London never lost its independence, and remains legally separate from Greater London to this very day. Really? Number 18. That's confusing. As such, the British monarch, it's Queen Liz right now, love you Liz, technically still needs permission to enter the city of London. Not that she'd want to visit, it's full of bankers. Number 19. The flag of the City of London is essentially the English flag with a sword in the corner, a symbol which supposedly <laughs> represents the sword that beheaded St. Paul, the patron oh. saint of the city. Though I don't know why we're celebrating his murder if that's the case, but hey. Uh, yeah. yeah. Number 20. Greater London used this flag for about 100 years up to 1984, and it did kind of look like a crown floating on the sea on Mars. However, since 1984, no flag has held official status. Number 21. London is built on and around the River Thames, which happens to be both tidal and non-tidal. For the less perceptive among you, huh? this means that after a certain point, the river is affected by the tides, causing the surface of the Thames to rise and fall by approximately 7 metres. That certain point in the river is known as Teddington Lock, located in the deliciously named district of Ham, in southeast <laughs> London, meaning that the vast majority of the London Thames is tidal, baby. Like Jay-Z's on-demand thing. Oh. oh. Look what you made me do. Uh, uh, uh. There are over 200 bridges which stretch across the entirety of the River Thames, the first of which was built in London by the Romans around 2,000 years ago, very uh. close to where London Bridge is located now. The longest bridge in London is Waterloo Bridge at 381 metres or 1,250 feet. I did a reaction video to a J7 <laughs> video about why there are no bridges in East London. And apparently the land's kind of marshy and it's more of a industrial area. There's not much demand for crossing the river in those areas. Number 23. A lot of people, including many Brits themselves, often assume that this is London Bridge, which is in fact so wrong it hurts. London Bridge is located roughly 850 meters away and is far less ostentatious. This fancy one here, that's called Tower Bridge. Number 24. People also assume Tower Bridge is named because of, well, because of the towers. In actual fact, the oh. name Tower Bridge simply comes from the structure's proximity to the Tower of London. Oh. Number 25. Okay. The upper walkways on Tower Bridge used to be open to the public, but they became such a popular spot for prostitutes to congregate that they were closed in 1910. <laughs> Number, eight, tw uh, <laughs> Number 26. What you also may not know is that throughout history, there have been numerous bridges known as London Bridge. The original London Bridge of the medieval period was used for more than 600 years, during which time hundreds of buildings were constructed on top of it. Some of these buildings were up to seven stories high and hung over the river by several feet. I did another reaction video to a Simon Whistler video where he talked about that bridge. And I thought, you know, it would be really cool if they recreated the original bridge and put like hotels and shops on the bridge. That would be a huge tourist attraction. Do it, London. You need more tourism. <laughs> Number 27. When the head of the rebellious Scot, William Wallace, was stuck on a spike and displayed atop the gatehouse at the southern end of the bridge, the authorities thought, well, that was fun. Was Why don't we really? make it like a thing we do? And wow. they did make it a thing they did, as the heads of traitors were often displayed in a similar manner for roughly 350 years. Wow. Often dozens of them at a time. That's dark. Number 28. Another oh of London's many Thames-spanning bridges is Waterloo Bridge. Interestingly, this particular bridge is also known as Ladies' Bridge, because a significant number of the workers who helped construct it were women, who filled the roles left by men conscripted to fight in World War II. Wow. Number 29. Apparently, an average of one body per week is pulled out of the Thames, <laughs> with some estimates putting it as high as one body a day. Oh my god, Number 30. really? Wow. Greater London What's is governed happening? by the London Assembly, which is led by the Mayor of London, a position currently occupied by Sadiq Khan. Khan is the first Muslim mayor of London, a fact that makes stupid people very upset indeed. Number 31. <laughs> London is a global city, and possibly THE global city. It's one of two mm. Alpha Plus Plus cities according to the Globalization and World Cities Research Network, the other one being New York, and tops the Global Power City Index carried out by the Institute of Urban Strategies. 
Essentially, London and New York are constantly battling it out to see who's the biggest and baddest sense. when it comes to diversity, that is. And there isn't always a clear winner. Number 32. London is the world's second most visited city going by international arrivals, outranked only by Bangkok. Measured by really? passenger traffic, London also has the world's largest city airport system. Number 33. Bangkok. London is also called home by more ultra high net worth individuals, or hungries, as I like to call them, than many other cities on Earth, with an hungry being defined as having a net worth of at least $30 million. London also has nice. the more billionaires than anywhere else, with an impressive 72 the last time we. Wow. Added. Number 34. When London hosted the Olympics in 2012, it became the first city ever to have hosted the modern Summer Olympic Games three times, with the other London Olympics taking place in 1908 and 1948. Incidentally, at 2016 Olympics in Rio, Great Britain became the very first nation to have ever increased its medal count directly after hosting the previous Games. That's not really a hmm. fact about London, sure, but I thought you guys would like to know. Number 35. London is also apparently the money laundering capital of the world. <laughs> apparently, and this is news nice. to me, banks sometimes help bad people get richer. <laughs> Who knew? Number 36. London is an incredibly diverse city, home to a range of people and cultures from all across the planet. As such, more than 300 languages are spoken in Greater London. The most widely spoken language is obviously English, followed by Polish, Bengali, Gujarati, French, Polish. Urdu, and Arabic. Polish is number, number two. 37, isn't it? Wow. Mm -hmm. London dominates the rest of the UK in terms of the sheer number of inhabitants, with Londoners accounting for 13.4% of the UK population. London was the world's most populated city from around 1831 to 1925. Then it was overtaken by the Japanese capital of Tokyo, those Stephen Bats. Wow. Number 38. London boasts the oldest underground railway network in the world, with the first section opening in 1863. Hmm. That being said, around 55% of the London underground is actually above ground, which by definition <laughs> also means it is built on a foundation of lies. Number right. The network of tunnels that make up the underground measures at around 249 miles long. However, this is not quite as impressive as the original plan for the tube, as it was initially intended to terminate in Paris. Number 40. Oh, wow. The London that's... Underground's iconic round blue and red logo is officially known as the Roundel, of which the largest is emblazoned on the exterior of Brixton Station. The Roundel is the oldest corporate brand of modern times. It's Number a good brand. 41. The average speed on the tube is a fairly mild 20.5 miles per hour. But if you're feeling extra daring, the trains on the Metropolitan Line can exceed a blistering 60 miles per hour. Wow. Oh, that's faster than Vin Diesel on speed. The meaning of life. The shortest trip on the tube is on the Piccadilly line between Leicester Square and Covent Garden. The journey is only 274 metres long and takes roughly 45 seconds from platform <laughs> to platform. Okay. Number 43. If you ever find yourself heading down into the underground at Aldgate Station, you may be disturbed or excited, I don't know what you're into, to find out that this particular station was built over a plague pit dating back to 1665. <gasps> As such, there are over 1,000 bodies beneath the station. It's probably extremely haunted. Wow. Number 44. One of the most common items to be left behind on tube carriages is umbrellas, 80,000 of which are lost <sighs> on the underground every year. I did year. hear about Other that. Other less common items left on the tube include a coffin, a park bench, a puffer fish, and a jar containing three dead bats. Oh, that's where I left them. Number 45. In May of 2008, then Mayor and living troll doll Boris Johnson <laughs> announced that from the 1st of June 2008, the consumption of alcohol on public transport in London would be prohibited. This promptly prompted large numbers of Londoners to don disguises and costumes and meet on the circle line on the eve of the ban for one final boozy underground awesome. knees-up. Which sounds like a great idea until someone gets hurt, and several people did get hurt before yeah. the police arrested 17 people. That's Number 46. Buckingham Palace, or Buck House as we call it here, is a common attraction for tourists visiting London which conveniently doubles as one of the Queen's homes. The Duke of Buckingham built the palace in 1703, which passed into royal hands almost 60 years later in 1761. Edward VII is the only British monarch to have been born and to have died in Buckingham Palace. Hmm. Number 47. Some teenager named Edward Jones broke into Buckingham Palace three times during the reign of Queen Victoria, and possibly sneaked in many more times too. On one occasion, he stole some of Queen Victoria's underwear. Eventually, Jones ended up in Australia, where he served as a town crier of Perth until his death in 1893, caused by a very nasty case of falling off a bridge and landing on his head. Seriously, I can develop quicker than you think. Edward Jones, dumb or brave? The boy Jones.
an English stalker who became notorious for breaking into Buckingham Palace several times. Jones was 14 years old when he broke into the palace. Two years later, he broke in again. He was found hiding under a sofa. <laughs> Why was he doing this? Ed, what are you doing? I guess they sent him to Australia. Ed, he was covered in bear's grease and soot. He climbed down the chimney. That's so dangerous, Ed. He told them his name was Edward Cotton. What a character. Someone should make a movie about Edward Jones. Number 48. There are a number of underground passageways that connect Buckingham Palace, Clarence House, and the Houses of Parliament. Really? On one occasion, the Queen Mother went exploring in some of these tunnels with King George VI, where they encountered a man who had apparently been living down there. The Queen Mother referred to him as a Geordie and very courteous. Wow. Number 49. That's funny. Buckingham Palace was directly hit by bombs a total of nine times during the Second World War. What? Making it the royal residence equivalent of 50 cent. Like the esteemed rapper, Buckingham Palace survived, continues to be an iconic London landmark, and raps songs about licking lollipops. Okay, those two things maybe aren't true for both of them, but- I don't get the 50 cent joke. Number 50. <laughs> Buckingham Palace is not just home to royalty. I was not aware of this. Royalty. New- I walked around the palace naked. Oh. Numerous palace employees live there as the building contains 188 staff bedrooms. Wow. Such live-in workers include flagmen, vendor smiths, and co co clock clock makers. Number 51. London is also home to the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, which defines the prime meridian, or zero degrees longitude. This is an arbitrarily positioned but useful line that encircles the planets via the North and South Poles, and as such, defines Greenwich Mean Time. Number 52. The London Eye is Europe's tallest Ferris wheel, standing proudly at 135 meters or 443 feet, if you're into that. It was the tallest Ferris wheel in the world until it was overtaken by larger wheels in the United States, China, and Singapore. Someone's a hmm. bit jealous, I think. <laughs> Number 53. However, it remains the largest cantilevered Ferris wheel, which if you don't know what that means, it's supported with an A-frame on only one side. Number 54. Oh. There are 32 capsules on the wheel which represent the 32 boroughs of Greater London. However, they are numbered up to 33, due to the old superstition regarding number 13, and as such, the oh. carriages skip from 12 to 14. I mean, yeah. would you like to ride in a London iPod labelled 13? No? no. You're a bit of an idiot, aren't you? <laughs> number 55. The London Eye is the most popular paid tourist attraction in the entire United Kingdom, with over 3.75 million visitors annually. Number 56. The Shard is a 1,107-foot tall skyscraper completed in 2012, located just south of the River Thames in Southwark, and was designed by award-winning Italian architect Renzo Piano. The Shard was Europe's tallest building until Russia decided to build three taller buildings. I can only assume that's a pettiness. 95% <laughs> of the construction materials used in the construction of the Shard are recycled. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I did a, I filmed a reaction video to the story of that guy who climbed the Shard. Something they left out of the video was that he was also uh, like a burglar and a thief. He stole a bunch of camera equipment. He was kind of a questionable character, but I didn't know that. The video did very poorly, but I think a lot of Londoners did not like him. Number 57. One of London's most esteemed thinkers was Karl Marx, who wrote Das Kapital in the reading room at the British Museum, as well as drafting the Communist Manifesto in a room above the Red Lion pub on Great Windmill Street, which is now a trendy B at one bar. One story tells of Marx and his pinko buddies drunkenly smashing up streetlights in London, and subsequently running away from police. For oh, that troublemaker. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Number 58. In 1907, the Russian leaders Stalin, Lenin, and Trotsky met at the now-demolished Brotherhood Church in Hackney for a meeting of the, now-banned, Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. Wow. This site is now unceremoniously occupied by Tesco Metro. There's no greater <laughs> honour, to be fair. There is no greater honour. Number 59. Though the River Thames gets all the river-based action in London, there are actually more rivers, guys. You just may not be able to see them. Oh, really? There's a lesson there about life. There are approximately 20 subterranean rivers flowing beneath London's streets. Wow. Number 60. I just want to see a map of these subterranean rivers. Well, well, there sure are. Secret rivers. I wonder if that's drinkable water or if it's salt water. Number 60. If you're in London and have a spare hour, if you stand on the platform at Sloan Square Station and look up, you'll notice a bridge running above the station. This is actually carrying the Westbourne River, a re-diverted tributary of the River Thames. Number 61. Another what? of London's subterranean rivers Say is the again? tip of the, of the station. This is actually carrying the Westbourne River, 
a re-diverted tributary of the River Thames. Wow. Number 61. Another of London's subterranean rivers is the Tyburn River, a section of which flows directly beneath Buckingham Palace. Number 62. Ever wanted to figuratively step back in time because doing so literally is far too difficult, if not impossible, because if it was possible, surely we'd be visited by people from the future by now anyway. Well, you're in luck. Described as still life drama, Dennis Severs' house in Folgate Street was created by an American dude named, wait for it, Dennis Severs, and is faithfully decorated in the style of various eras following the lives of a fictional family of the Huguenot silk weavers. Number 63. The home is lit entirely by candlelight, lacks modern heating, and the rooms are arranged as if they're currently still being lived in, and the family literally just left moments prior. As such, half-eaten bread and household objects sit on top of the tables, as though the inhabitants were enjoying a lazy Sunday morning, but ran outside when they heard the ice cream van, which promptly killed them in a ghastly hit and run. Well, that's what I imagine happened anyway. Nintendo 64. The Houses of Parliament, you may not have heard of them, are officially known as the Palace of Westminster, and is the largest palace in the whole country. It was originally built next to the Thames River so that it couldn't be totally surrounded by an angry mob, allowing those trapped inside to escape by the Thames. Number 65. Huh, it's a palace. The palace's world-famous clock tower is commonly referred to as Big Ben, but Big Ben is actually the name of the bell, which incidentally chimes in the key of E, in case you've ever wondered. The hmm. structure itself was previously known simply as the clock tower, until it was renamed Elizabeth Tower in 2012. Oh. Number 66. Okay. The Latin word seen <laughs> under the clock face of Elizabeth Tower reads Domin Salvum Fac Regionam Nostram Victoriam Primam, which translates to O oh Lord, keep safe our Queen Victoria the First. Wow, it's a bit out of date. They should really give that a yeah. up. Except replace Queen Victoria with Dale Winton. Number 67. Every country has silly laws that were never officially repealed, and the United Kingdom is no different. For instance, it's technically illegal to die in the Palace of Westminster, as anyone who dies within its grounds is eligible for a state funeral. <laughs> that, though, is what an <laughs> incorrect person would say. Haha, <laughs> gotcha! There is literally no evidence for this often quoted claim, and none of the several people who have known to have died on the palace grounds, including Guy Fawkes, Sir Walter Riley, and Spencer Percival, incidentally the only British Prime Minister to have been assassinated, received a state funeral. Oh. Number 68. You may be forgiven for thinking that Cock Lane in Smithfield must have some sort of poultry-related history, and its humorous name is nothing but a lewd coincidence. Well, stop being so prude, because actually, it's exactly what it sounds like. The street was home to a number of legal brothels during the medieval period, when it was known as Cox Lane. And the name stuck, so yeah, it's a lane <laughs> for cock. You know, wow. You know, you know what I mean. I appreciate Number that. 69. Cock Lane? If you thought that last fact was shocking, know that London has always been a city obsessed with sex, even if no one wants to admit it. For instance, it's estimated that during some periods of the 1700s, up to 20% of all women in London were prostitutes. That's one in five. Wow. Most of them hanging around the walkways on Tower Bridge, I should have thought. <laughs> Number 70. One London skyscraper very quickly earned itself a somewhat extreme reputation before it was even completed. 20 Fenchurch Street, designed by architect Raphael Vinoli and nicknamed the Walkie Talkie due to its distinctive concave shape, has a oh, distinctive yeah. concave shape. So distinctively concave, in fact, that it focused sunlight on the streets below, melting parts of a car and scorching a carpet in a barber shop. The effect was so extreme that people were able to fry eggs on the street using only the reflected sunlight. What? The building has what? since been covered in a non-reflective film, as oh. has another of Vinodi's buildings in Las Vegas, which had a similar problem. It looks like an old Mac computer. It reminds me of this. Hey, you can get one for 140 bucks now. Year 2000. Still working? I had one of those uh, where I worked and a liquid came out of it one day and it stopped working. Number 71. Nelson's Column is a 169-foot memorial to Admiral Horatio Nelson, who died at the Battle of Trafalgar during the Napoleonic Wars. Before the monument was completed by placing the statue of Nelson atop the column in 1842, 14 stonemasons had a snake dinner on top. Which sounds like delicious danger. <laughs> Number 72. The oldest continually existing judicial position in England and Wales is that of the Queen's Remembrancer, or King, if he's a dude, a role that was created by King Henry II in 1154. What? This person presides over a number of ceremonies, one of which is the Trial of the Picks, in which newly minted coins are judged as to whether or not they conform to the required standards. Talk about that in another video, by the way. There it is, right on screen. Oh, yeah. Number 73. The GDP of London alone is substantially larger than that of several European countries, including the Netherlands, Portugal, Sweden, and Poland as well as literally every single country in Africa. 
Number 74. I believe that. A total of 22 people were executed at the Tower of London, the last of whom was That's German all? soldier Joseph Jacobs, a German spy who broke his ankle parachuting into a field in Cambridgeshire. He was executed by firing squad on the 15th of August 1941. Only 20 people? Throughout its 1,000 year history, only 22 people were executed inside the Tower of London. And more than half of those occurred during the 20th century. When I think of the Tower of London, I think of, like, people being tortured in the basement. I guess torturing is not killing, though, so I guess it doesn't count. Number 75. The Tower of London is said to be resident to several ghosts, including Henry VI, Henry VIII's fifth wife, Catherine Howard, and even a grizzly bear that once lived in the tower, which apparently frightened the guard so much that he died only two days after seeing it. Number 76. Some of the Tower of London's most treasured residents are the Ravens. There must be at least six Ravens in residence at any one time by a royal decree put in place by Charles II. What? According to legend, if the Raven should leave the tower, the British monarchy and the White Tower will fall. That's a dumb criteria to put on yourself. You're just leaving yourself open to that happening. There have to be at least six Ravens at... Wait, come on. You gotta be joking. Why, why put that on yourself? These magnificent birds respond only to the Raven Master and should not be approached too closely by anyone else. There's a Raven Master? They have names? Edgar and Branwen? Yo, I got ravens outside right now. They don't need my help. They don't need me to feed them or take care of them or anything. They just fly around and do their own thing. Watching people. They make this noise that's like... It's very weird. Ravens. How macabre. Number 77. Television host Jerry Springer was born on the 13th of February 1944 in Highgate Tube Station while his mother took shelter during a Luftwaffe bombing raid. So what? you have Highgate Tube Station to thank for things like this. Yeah. Well. Number 78. A delightful 40% of Greater London is green space, which is mostly thanks to Henry VIII. The city created a number of wonderful parks from land he acquired from the nice. church during the dissolution. Which, by the way, uh, happened because Rome wouldn't let Henry divorce his first wife so he could marry Anne Boleyn, right. who he later did marry but then had beheaded. Classy guy. <laughs> Number 79. London has a reputation as a wet, gloomy, rainy city full of sad, moany, grey British people. Right. And while that may be very, very true, London actually receives less precipitation per year than New York, Rome and even Sydney. The really? problem is that London's rainfall is spread over more days. So even though oh. London is drier, it feels wetter. Number 80. Of all the gold held by the various governments in the world, about one-fifth of it, worth approximately £188 billion, pounds, or $248 billion, if that's your bag, is stored beneath the streets of Threadneedle Street in the city of London, in the form of 6,256 tonnes worth of gold. Each bar is roughly worth £350,000, or half a million dollars. Which is funny, wow. <laughs> knowing that gold is merely a chemical element, only given value by the fact that humans just think it looks nice. Right. Okay, maybe funny is the wrong word. It also conducts Number electricity 81. and doesn't corrode. In 2013, Norwegian comedy duo Ilvis asked the question, what does the fox say? It was a great moment <laughs> for culture all around the world, yes. I remember but that. they'd clearly never spent an extended time in London, because every Londoner knows that fox sound like this. <laughs> There are around 10,000 foxes living in London, and when they mate, they sound like they're being brutally murdered. And also, does it scare anyone else that there's 10,000 of them out there and no one knows where they are during the day? Number 82. The London Bridge, built in the 1830s, was later dismantled in 1967 and relocated to, of all places, Arizona, in a small city named Lake Havasu City. The bridge even bears the City of London coat of arms. Number 83. Every year, an enormous Christmas tree is hoisted into position and festooned in lights and shiny baubles as part of London's extensive Christmas decorations. This tree comes directly from Norway, as a gift from the people of Oslo hmm. to the people of London for their assistance during the Second World War. And guys, you're welcome, okay? Anytime. Anytime. <laughs> Not anytime, I don't want to be any yours, but hey, you're welcome. Number 84. One of the most popular tourist attractions of the 18th century London was the Bedlam Asylum. If that sounds like I'm suggesting people used to pay money to witness the suffering of mentally ill people, you'd only be mostly right, because entry to Bedlam was free on the first Tuesday of every month. For the rest of the month, punters would have to fork out an entire penny to stare at sick people as a form of entertainment. I would not it's do that. It's from this asylum that, that we get the word Bedlam, meaning chaotic confusion or uproar. Oh, it was originally called Bethlehem or Bethlehem after Bethlehem, and it just became Bedlam. Started in 1377 and in 1403... It started to be a specialist institution for the confinement of the insane. 
By 1460, it totally was. And then from the 14th century, Bethlehem started to be called Bedlam. And that's where we get that term. Pretty dark. Watching insane people for entertainment. <clears throat> I mean, that's reality TV. Number 85. The code name of the world's most famous spy, Jason Bond, no, I'm joking, James Bond, was inspired by the bus route that author Ian Fleming took from Canterbury to London, the 007. Hmm. The route is still in service. Number 86. The world's first traffic signal was installed in London in 1868, although it did last less than a month because of the small technical issue involving it, um, exploding. It's even <laughs> injured the police officer in charge of operating it. Yeah, not a great look. Mm. Number 87. One of the most famous statues in London is located in Piccadilly Circus and is commonly known as the Statue of Eros, except it isn't Eros at all. The statue was built to honour the philanthropic work of Lord Shaftesbury, and as such is not Eros, the god of romantic sexual love, but his twin brother Anteros, the god of selfless mature love. Regardless, the statue was still considered lewd by the prudish Victorians, and so it was renamed the Angel of Christian Charity <laughs> to shut the buzzkills up. Number 88 if you ever find yourself having a stroll through Soho, and hey, why wouldn't you, it's 2017, you may begin to notice that a number of the buildings have noses. Don't worry, you're not tripping bald. These are known as the London Noses, and were installed on numerous buildings in 1997 by artist Rick Buckley, I as a form that. of protest against the rise of CCTV cameras. Buckley's oh. work was not advertised, and so various mythic explanations arose as the origin of the noses, That's none hilarious. of which are true. Number 89. Trafalgar Square contains four large plinths, three of which are adorned with statues of English kings, but a fourth statue was never made due to insufficient funds. As such, the fourth plinth now features a rolling program of temporary artworks, which in the past has included a statue of Jesus, a giant ship in a bottle, and a massive cock. This guy. For a period in 2009, Anthony Gormley hosted a 100-day-long performance artwork called One and Other, in which 2,400 people were each given an hour on the plinth in which to do whatever they wanted. Participants included <laughs> London destroying the London skyline, a mouthy football referee, and naked people, because of course that was going to happen. Hilarious. 90. <laughs> what did I say? Number 90. Up until relatively recently, Trafalgar Square was famously home to thousands and thousands of pigeons. Eventually, the novelty of constant fecal bombing raids wore off. And in 2008, then London Mayor Ken Livingston declared war on the Trafalgar Square pigeons and banned feeding them and the selling of birdseed near the square. A hawk was even brought in to keep them away. Oh, wow. Eventually, the population began to decrease, and now Trafalgar Square is largely pigeon free. Huh. But there's probably still poo everywhere. Lakes are cooler anyway. They are. Number 91. One of the most famous art museums in London, and indeed the whole world, is the Tate Modern. The museum is housed inside the Bankside Power Station, which incidentally was designed by Charles Gilbert Scott, who also designed Britain's iconic red telephone boxes. Oh wow. Number 92. The M25 Ring Road that circles London is an incredible 117 miles long, and when it was first created, it was the largest orbital road in the world. It's now second behind the Berlin Ring Barn. Number hmm. 93. London buses are as much a symbol of the city as the London Eye and the Houses of Parliament. But why, oh why, are they such an arresting shade of red? It's kind of sexy. Well, before 1907, they weren't, as buses used to come in a range of colours with various companies operating different routes. In 1907, one company rouged up his entire fleet in an effort to stand out and quickly become the largest bus Smart. company. When public transport in London was unified in 1933, the red colour was retained. Number 94. Spitalfields, an area in the London borough of Tower Hamlet, used to be known as Lulsworth, which is what I'm going to change my second name to. Number 95. A traffic island near Marble Arch features a stone plaque marking the original site of the Tibburn Tree, a triangular gallows where over 50,000 people were executed over the centuries. 50,000. Number 96. Sir Christopher Wren, the 17th century British architect who designed St Paul's Cathedral, may not sound like much of a wild child, but he apparently did have a kooky side, as he planned to top the iconic dome with an enormous 18 metre tall pineapple. Unfortunately, this addition was ultimately not included, but his passion for pineapples was included in St Paul's in the form of two stylized gold pineapples atop the church's towers. Wren apparently considered the pineapple to be a symbol of friendliness, hospitality and generosity, and a place where sponges can live too. Number 97. The area of Soho is said to get its name from a medieval hunting cry, and up until the 17th century, it was just open fields rather than the uh, centre of debauchery it is today. <laughs> I'm actually going there later if anyone wants to come, as in come with me, not like that. That's interesting. There's a Soho in New York, but it gets the name from south of Houston. Number 98. For centuries, a plaque in the Church of St. Martin's in the Fields near Trafalgar Square has marked the centre of London, from which all distances to the city are measured. 
However, according to British Army cartographers, the actual exact centre of London is about 900 metres away, next to an unassuming park bench on Victoria Embankment in front of King's College London, near huh. to Temple Tube Station. Number 99. Mm. Hidden underneath Cleopatra's needle on Victoria Embankment is a time capsule from 1878. It's said to contain a portrait of Queen Victoria, copies of 10 daily newspapers, cigars, a razor, and pictures of 12 English beauties of the day. Open I'm it up. making the same thing, but it's all just Jennifer Lawrence pictures. And a lock of my hair. Number, Number 100. 100. West Norwood Cemetery is the world's first gothic cemetery, which I assume means that it was the first cemetery to attract goths, but I suppose I could be wrong. It features underground catacombs full of lead-lined coffins, due to the fact that many of those buried there died of contagious diseases like smallpox and tuberculosis. Oh. Sounds hot. Number 101! We made it, y'all. Incidentally, West Norwood is also the hometown of British songstress Adele, who wrote the song Hometown Glory about the town. A million years ago, it was written about the nearby Brockwell Park, where she used to sit, play guitar, and drink cider with her friends. Ah, oh, lovely, lovely fact there at the end about the actual Queen of England, Adele. But if you want to know more about Adele, or indeed about anything, let me know in the comments below. What videos do you want to see next on 101 Fact? What do you think about that, though? Why not check out these other videos here? We made it, y'all. 101 Facts About London. I feel like I forgot 99% of them. A lot of those just skated by. Strange to think that London was started by the Romans because it feels like it would be older than that. I know that's a long time ago, but it seems like a great place for a city because it's on the river, but far enough inland that it's away from the ocean. So you get some protection or some warning if there's attackers coming in by the water. Great place to build a city. All the underground rivers, you have water to drink. Are they freshwater rivers? Oh, the Thames is brackish, which is a mixture of fresh and salt water. Drinking untreated Thames river water is unsafe. I would assume that the other rivers flowing under London are also brackish, but I don't know. I couldn't find anything about that. Where do they get their water from? Where does London get its water? They do get it from the Thames, but I guess they filter it, treat it. Well, wow, learned a lot in this video. A lot of really fun little trivial things. I think they did mention everything that I predicted they would at the beginning, I think. It's amazing to think about all of the, the impact that the city of London has had over the centuries. So many notable people have lived there, have traveled through there. Human history has been hugely affected by London. It's pretty amazing to think about. The largest empire since the Romans, right? Larger than the Roman Empire, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Romans weren't in Bermuda or <laughs> the Bahamas or the Falkland Islands. What a great city. I'm sure there are at least a million other little facts like this. Great video. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Later.